despite all our economic woes, <laughs> uh, this is still the land of opportunity. And um, I read a statistic that 40% of illegal immigrants are people who came in legally and overstayed once they came here. They found jobs, they found opportunity, etc. There's also a big brain drain from many Latin American countries for people who come here to study and don't go back, for example, example because opportunities here are, are better than in their own countries. So what do you have to do, Mark, to, uh, to turn that around? Because it, just the other day, uh, the Mexican ambassador, Arturo Sorucan, was speaking to a, a group where he mentioned what a loss this is for Mexico. He says, everybody talks about remittance income, but we're also losing energetic, clever, nervy, entrepreneurial people to the United States, and we can really use them in Mexico. Right. Well, we've been talking literally for decades, academics and analysts have been talking about sort of development as an alternative to immigration and that in the long run, the way you reduce pressure for immigration and, and the way you reduce pressure for unauthorized immigration is by creating better opportunities uh, in countries of origin in Mexico and, and, and um, you know, giving people that incentive to stay. Um, you know, what we've seen, including with NAFTA, is that um, in a best case scenario, that is a long term strategy because in the short run, economic development is disruptive and, and people move from the farm to the cities and, 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 and traditional modes of production become less viable. Um, so it's, it's very much a long term strategy and it's, and it's something that we've not at all systematically thought about in terms of migration and, and even with Latin America put at the forefront of our foreign policy as much as we have with, with some other regions. So um, that, that's you know, that's, that, those are the kinds of solutions that, that should be part of this conversation. When you look at the Ellis Island generations, the people who are getting on ships in Hamburg and Palermo and Naples and coming here, there were, for the time, communications networks that were pretty good. There was an idea of where to go and what to do, and the idea also that America, once you got there, wasn't going to ask too many questions. As long as you weren't insane or obviously ill, you were going to come in. The welcome is not the same today. Um, and I, I, when I talk to people in places like Puebla and Michoacan, they still are willing to take their chances, even though they understand that the border is getting harder, that the conditions are getting tougher, that it's harder to hide, that there are raids, that there are deportations. That's that's an interesting aspect to all of this, that even in the absence of welcome, people still figure it's worthwhile to take a chance. Well, I think it is, again, as we said, the, the sign of I think, desperation for a lot of people. Let's put even a more extreme example. Central Americans who know that they have to cross through Mexico and face a series of risks, including kidnapping, death, rape, et cetera, on their way to the United States, and they're still willing to come. I think because if you're looking at home and saying, I have no economic opportunities here. I have two children and a wife that I need to support. What are my options? Let me see if I can press my luck in the United States, knowing that it's a difficult situation, knowing that you are going to be discriminated against here, that you face lots of risks in the United States. I think it is a sign of you know, the, the need that people feel to improve their livelihoods in spite of all the risks. And again, as, as Mark was saying, the lack of development opportunities in these countries, if they have no real feeling from their government, et cetera, of support of programs that would help them get jobs or improve their, their agricultural sector, then, then they are feeling that need to move. Is there an awareness of the change in the welcome here? I, absolutely. There's, uh, I mean, I, there's been a lot of there's, there's research that University of California, San Diego, just conducted in sending communities in Mexico. And one of the things that they were struck by is uh, how uh, aware people are of political changes here and very detailed knowledge of uh, the types of enforcement uh, uh, mechanisms that are in place at the border and within, um, uh, you know, at, at the state and local level. And I actually think, um, uh, you know, well, I mean, first of all, we know that, that unauthorized inflows have fallen quite dramatically since the economic downturn, and it's very much because uh, people uh, they know about the enforcement and they know that, that there's not the same kind of job opportunities that there were four or five years ago. And importantly, because their families in the U.S. and or the families in Mexico, but you, typically it's the families in the U.S., 
aren't able to um, make the investment in, in traveling here illegally because it costs between $2,500 and $5,000 to you know, pay a smuggler and to, and to make the trip. And so, um, and, and that's you know, a function of, of, of enhanced enforcement that those, those costs have gone up. But with the economy down, you know, the, the projected return on that investment is, is less certain. Um, and, and people in the U.S. don't have, you know, just don't have the money to, to finance a relative's trip. So, so we've definitely seen uh, a fall off, both because people know that, that jobs aren't available and because they don't have the resources to finance the trip. So it's not, you know, it's not actually the poorest of the poor in Mexico and Central America who are able to migrate illegally. It's people who can, who can you know, who have the resources to make that investment, and, and they very much see it as an investment. But you have to have confidence not that there's going to be a difference, because obviously there's going to be a difference in, for instance, rates of pay, but that the margin between what you were going to get working in your hometown and what you're going to get in Phoenix is enough to make it all worthwhile. Ambassador, you were going to say? Yeah, no, I think um, in the last decade we've seen uh, increased immigration to the U.S., and now you do have family uh, mechanisms to help uh, relatives coming to the States that you didn't have 10, 15, 20 years ago. So weighing everything, uh, conditions aren't improving dramatically in Latin America. And yes, it's still riskier. It's riskier now to enter the U.S., but it's still, when you balance everything, I think it's a, it's a, it's a bet that they're willing to take most, uh, most immigrants, those you, who can't afford the payments. Uh, to the you tourists. mentioned that conditions aren't dramatically better in Latin America, but by many measures, they are dramatically better in Latin America. I mean, the kinds of things that we're sending for instance, Central Americans here in the 80s and 90s, are less pressing. That's right. The less. civil wars are over. Uh, and if you look at economic indicators, some countries have made dramatic improvement. But uh, Latin America is still the region of the world where there is the widest uh, income gap in, uh, or income distribution. Uh, about a third of Latin Americans survive on 2 or $3 a day. And as long as you have those uh, disparities, uh, you are going to have immigration. Illegal immigration. Are, uh, Colonel, um, other countries as concerned about keeping people at home as the United States is about keeping them from coming? All countries should be concerned about keeping people at home, but not all are. To some, being able to get rid of the poor, the unemployed, is a relief valve that actually helps their development. And I think we can address this, particularly in Central America. The, the, the excess youth that is not able to find jobs uh, is creating the, the maras and all of the other gangs because they have nothing to do. So now they're calling what is the ninis, ni estudian ni trabajan. And that is the source of the, uh, of, of the firepower of the, of the drugs and thugs because they have thousands of people available to do this. So there has to be a shift in terms of the job opportunity and to invest more in Central America and here goes back to an element that was mentioned earlier. The productivity of the American continent, the productivity of North America to compete better with Asia, with Europe, and that is not just jobs in the U.S., but jobs throughout the continent, investing in the natural resources and the people. And then going back to the Mexico-U.S. issue, I think if we look at the shift that has always occurred in the circular migration, yeah, Mexico needs to keep its talent there. But Mexico has trained a lot of the talent in the U.S. as it has gone back to, to Mexico and continues to do so. But it, it becomes more difficult every day. In the U.S.-Mexico chamber, we're beginning to address industry that is expanding like Ford, like aviation in Mexico. And we're suggesting that actually they begin to recruit Mexican workers in the U.S. 